Uh, okay, Jim, I'll go ahead and start. Yeah, we need to go here. Yeah. No, no, we can't. Right? Okay. Okay, listen up, guys. I want to have Mark just talk for a few minutes about what he is here, and he's taking some great photographs. I'd like to have him explain them to you. Yes, you can. This is his rendition of what he's No, these are things that he's actually photographed. These are actual photographs. These are actual photographs. Uh, I'm gonna well, put, he's going to put explain photographs that. here on the he's, left. He's anyway. going to explain that a little bit. Hi, okay. I'm Mark Seibel with Rose City Strummers. I've, I've been a member of the group now for, uh, oh gosh, almost 30 years. Um, I'm an old guy. Um, I tell this to Jim recently. I think we're about the same age. But, um, um, I started out making photographs before I did artwork. The artwork was more recent. And unfortunately, I left the newer portfolio tonight at home. I ran out and left it. And had all the recent new artworks that I wanted to show you because uh, looking through telescopes and looking at pictures in books and online is, are many different things. And today, of course, as you all know, uh, your parents probably have really nice digital cameras, some of them. And uh, like the ones taking the film of me speaking here right now, I think it's actually going. I hope it is. I'm going to check it. But uh, I'm going to darken the uh, image here so we can see, uh, zoom in on this a bit. And, uh, but these are early works of the moon looking through telescopes. And when astronomers look through telescopes, they're seeing a much different view than what the general public thinks, looking at beautiful Hubble pictures in the Internet or even photographs and books from a few years ago. Things have changed drastically because of the online world today and because of the digital cameras we have now, which are very sensitive. There are actually amateur astronomers today that are able to take uh, photographs, not like I did with a film camera 25, 30 years ago. We just did what were called star trails back then. We let the, the, uh, the camera shutter stay open and we allowed uh, the sky to turn at night around Polaris, the North Star. And I wish I had the other one I wanted to show you that was more impressive than this. With a, I probably have it in here somewhere. I've got so much. Uh, I'm going to just keep talking at random, and if you have any questions, just go ahead and feel free to ask. But uh, here's a longer one. This is a 45 minute aimed at Polaris, the North Star. It always seems to stay there like it never moves. Does anybody know why the North Star doesn't ever seem to move? Any guesses? Now don't be shy. You can ask anything you want. Well, it's always what? That, well, that's good. That's a good. That's almost right. Uh, in fact, that's, you're just about right on. The Earth's axis that we spin on every 24 hours, this imaginary pole, we call it, is pointed at Polaris, or the pole star, or the North Star. So as we turn at night, the stars seem to turn counter motion around it. So your eyes will not see what happens in 45 minutes like this, because it's a very slow, gradual change. But in two hours, you may be out late some night and look up, and you'll notice that all these stars have moved west, because we're turning east. And as you know, New York City is three hours ahead of us. So things that were straight overhead, the first stars we see tonight are usually like Vega. It's real bright in the summer sky. It'll probably be the first bright one here because I haven't got my orientation down. But I know due north is like this way. But Vega's over here in the trees yet. But by midsummer, it's moved at the same hour you look any night. It's, everything has moved west. And that's because our trip around the sun has moved a little further. But the Earth is going around the sun every 365 days. It's also spinning on our axis every 24 hours, and the moon is going around in counter motion every 29 and a half days, or almost one month. So lots of things moving and changing. And as astronomers look more into the sky, we start to learn all these motions. The ancients did this too, as I think Jim might have mentioned this earlier. Um, they looked at the skies. They didn't have television to look at. They didn't have iPhones. I was born when there was no television yet in Portland. I'm that old. There was no TV broadcast yet when I was born. So what did we do without televisions? Well, we did a lot of artwork. We start sketching and looking through telescopes. And um, these are small, older works. These are. Um, did you make these? I did. I made most of these about in the last. Oh, I was sketching as a child, but my parents had me a camera. When I was about age two or three, and that may have been a mistake because I started walking around the house with an old Kodak box camera and taking pictures of everybody. I thought I was taking pictures, but there was no film in it. So I was pretending to look in the viewfinder and walk around. But by the time I got into high school, I started taking pictures of the night sky. And then um, I wish I had those early photos because I don't have them with me here. But things like this, this was on an old film camera. But this 
was done, well, I'm going to have to get a little stand here and do this. I don't have the easel I thought I had, but uh, this was done about two winters ago. It was the Lovejoy Comet. And the telescope, the way you see it set up, photographed this comet with the camera on top of the telescope, not looking through the scope, but just the telescope used for its motor drive. You're going to look some some really big telescopes tonight, and they're just manually operated. They're moved by hand, and they're called Dobsonians, and they were made popular by a gentleman that built these in a monastery in San Francisco back in the 1960s. But serious amateur astronomers today have telescopes that have motor drives on them, and they're tracking the sky's motion. They stay exactly fixed on the star's motion. So you can take long time exposures like this and see faint comets, galaxies, and nebulas, which we'll try to show you tonight in these bigger scopes. But, um, I just did this as kind of an example of me with my telescope, and it's all... Is it true that each star is 2,000 miles apart from each other? Well, that, now that I don't know. The stars are many different distances, of course. Um, more than miles. When we get out to space, the distances are so big, we don't talk about mileage, we talk about light years. And our star is about eight light minutes away. It takes light from the sun eight minutes to reach us. But, um, I'm just going to adjust this real quick here. But the next nearest star is about four light years away. So that runs into a light year is about six trillion miles. So when you said 2,000 miles, you might have thought maybe 2,000 light years is maybe what the star's distances are between them. And if you're able to stay out late enough tonight, you're going to see a, a very bright galaxy in the northeast sky rising called the Andromeda Galaxy. And I'll show you pictures of that here in a second. That's why I asked Jim if we could do some online stuff, because most of my stuff is online. Um, as you know, the whole world of photography is becoming online today. Do you need some help? Oh, no, it's okay. I'm just going to... I'm going to remount this so it's a little narrower here, but... Um, actually, if you want someone wants to come over here and just stand right here and hold this... Yeah, just for a second. Yeah, stand up. I can probably... Right there, red shirt, go forward. Go ahead, go, go, go and help it. And just, just watch the tripod. This is a tripod. But okay, yeah. just kind of hold that so it won't fall. It's kind of heavy. Got it? Take both hands. Both hands. There you go. Mm. We're just going to raise this up a little bit. Um, a little higher, maybe? Let's see. Okay, that's good. So I kind of haphazardly threw all this together tonight and arriving late, and I think it's okay now. Thanks. Thanks, Drew. Thanks a lot. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for your assistance. Yeah, thanks a lot. That was great. It's just what I needed. But since the days of film photography, like you see here, taking star trails was very easy. But today, in order to get still pictures, um, I'm looking for my portfolios in the dark now. I uh, started taking what people call today panoramas. Instead of taking a single photograph of the camera, you put the camera on a tripod, you aim it in the sky, and you take the shot starting at a corner of the sky, and you move it and take another one, you move it. And you do this over and over until you've mapped the whole sky out in this huge grid. And you take it home, and on your computer, you stitch them all together. And you have this huge image. I don't know if you can see this in the dark here. This is really dim. I purposely made these rather dark so that they look natural. Because we're seeing a lot of pictures today on the Internet that are really overblown. Some people are over-processing their images and they're making them look quite unnatural. But down at Cannon Beach, if you know where that's at in Oregon, uh, beaches, there's a big rock there called Haystack Rock. And the Milky Way looks like it's rising over here in the summer skies now at night. Mark, can they come up uh, later on here? And oh yeah, I'll leave these up, and I'll leave the lights okay. on. You can come by and look at them all through the evening need if you to want to. Up here, Mark. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, uh, so photographs like this, is not, they're not a separate photograph. They are, uh, there are many, there's a hundred photographs and they're all stitched together. And these stitching programs are all done uh, automatically in computers today. They're, they're quite easily done. Uh, Here's another one. You can see the original stitching of it put together. It's not cut out. It's got rough edges around it, untrimmed, of all this, the separate pictures that were mapped across the sky. You see mosaics like this a lot by NASA, too, today. And, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to see these uh, in, the, in the dark, but these are phenomenal pictures. I'll do this and, one. And maybe you can yeah, come up I'll, later on and I'll see them. I'll put this much, up, much and, brighter. Uh, but this was down in Trinidad, California, about a month ago. And it's uh, the southern sky you're going to be able to see tonight. As Jim said, you're going to be able to look further south here, low on the south horizon, which is a famous area for astronomers to view in the summer skies. And what you're looking at is the center of our galaxy. Um, and she had a good question earlier. She asked about the distances between stars. But there's many things in this photo, uh, more than just stars. The bright objects here are Mars, Saturn, 
the star Antares, I don't know, I think it's 50 light years, something like that. Antares is known as a red giant, you can see it's got a slight reddish color, and they compare it to Mars a lot, which is kind of orange red, but Saturn's kind of just basically yellow. But uh, the stars you see out in here are in our own galaxy. We reside in this galaxy, we're within this. And, uh, oh, let's see, let me grab just one other folder here real quick. But that's another mosaic of many star photos put together, maybe about, oh, 10, 20, 30 photos all stitched together. And uh, I know it's getting dark, and Jim probably wants you to start heading over to the observing area. I'll just show you one more here. Um, find that one. Really good I was going to say something about Aurora Borealis because a lot of people ask me if you have to go to Alaska to see Aurora and you do not. It's seen many nights here in Oregon out of Trillium Lake south of Mount Hood. You can see the uh, the red green light here over the mountains. This was unknown until I got there that night so I didn't even know it was going to happen. I was just there to photograph the Milky Way which you can see the big band of light in an arc. Is our galaxy that we're inside of. You're seeing the big ellipse of the spiral arm on our side that we reside in, and uh, you can see it on the east side of the Hood, or? It's much darker on the east side of Mount Hood, yes, and it's uh, anywhere you get tonight, like even tonight, that's dark enough here, you'll probably be able to see it a little later um, as the sky darkens. We're not really in total darkness yet, but you're going to be able to start looking at Jupiter before it goes down here in the southwest sky, and then Mars and Saturn are rising about 20 minutes ago, and they'll be up high enough in the next hour for you and to see those. the tree is blocking Jupiter right now, but it's kind of straight up uh, oh, Right, still pretty there. There's an airplane. Yeah. Oh, that's an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, astronomers don't observe those. No, I, 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 I can see Jupiter. Right? Yeah. But, uh, see, she's so pretty. Yeah. So, uh, here's one from Bandon on the beach. I didn't think I had it. Did you see something? Am I missing something? I heard this ooze and ahs. Did I not look at something? Oh, what's that? Oh, the photo. I thought they were looking at the company of the sky, yeah. <laughs> this is down at Bandon on Southern Oregon's beach. Uh, about a month ago, I took a photo of the beach at sunset in near daylight and took a shot of the sky at night. The sky at night was showing the zodiacal light. I guess I got my camera in this focus so you can see it. But, uh, zodiacal light is something you see this time of year and again in the fall in the morning skies. It's the cone of light in our solar system. It's like a huge ring around Saturn, but the whole solar system of planets also reside in a huge ring of dust.